I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with me, the zigzag man, Alameda, California, down by the lagoon, where um, I record this program on a very regular basis. And I'm thrilled today to have as a guest, I'm bi-coastal, if you will, from uh, New York, where I grew up, Queens, New York. Uh, please help me welcome a Facebook friend. And uh, one of the most intelligent women I've met on a lot of different levels, and you're going to be thrilled to to meet her, um, ladies and gentlemen, Mary Finn. So great to listen to you, Ralph. You have a beautiful voice. I'm really excited to hear what what we're going to have on the show today. Uh well, what we're going to have is somebody demystifying Queens, New York, and I'm not really qualified. I grew up in New York, and um, when I was about five or six, my family moved to Queens, and I had my um, elementary school, my middle school, and my high school in Queens, and um, which was terrific. I loved growing up in New York, and I, um, I cherish my childhood memories on a lot of different levels, but my big regret, and it really isn't a, grit, a regret because one can't live their lives um, on, in two different places, and um, my quest to be bicoastal goes on to these days. I moved out to California through the Air Force, which uh, during Vietnam was a good place to spend time and avoid the draft, and I've been in California as an adult. So it's been years since I've been in Queens um, to live, and um, I want to get a taste of what it would have been like, because I moved out in 1965, what were some of the changes that went on in Queens? And first of all, why don't you tell us, Mary, why it is that Queens is so... um, misunderstood as one of the five boroughs in New York. It's very underrated. Give me a little history of of Queens. and um, You lived there all your life. What do you think of it? And, um, you know, what do you look back on? Well, uh, Queens actually is a very misunderstood borough. Uh, I think because it doesn't have a lot of the cachet of Manhattan or Brooklyn. Uh, It's always been known as one of the more sleepy, one of the more conservative boroughs. Also, what we have as Queens today is actually a shadow of the original borough of Queens because before they created the unified city of New York at the end of the 19th century, all of what is today's Nassau County was considered the eastern part of Queens. And then they, uh, they split off about an argument about creating the five boroughs that we have today and uh, the part that is now Nassau County refused to have anything to do and with uh, with New York City and became Nassau County. So Queens is actually very old, goes back to colonial days, is just as old as Manhattan. Uh, so there's been a lot of changes in Queens, but it's something that a lot of people don't know too much about. I think the one thing that you see a lot of in Queens is you see the stereotype of uh, Archie Bunker, you know, from All in the Family. It's a very uh, interesting borough, but uh, people have strange ideas about it. Okay, did Queens play any part in the Revolutionary War? Yes, Queens played a part in the Revolutionary War. Um so did Brooklyn. A lot of uh, the Revolutionary War battles were fought along the uh, the terminal moraine, which is the middle of Long Island. It's the high part. It's the high part of uh, of uh, of uh, Long Island. It's a ridge that goes down the middle of Long Island, and um, and it's where the where the glaciers basically stopped uh, thousands of years ago, and. That's what created a high land. So yes, there are parts of Revolutionary Wars that were uh, that were in Queens and in Long Island, and in Brooklyn. Huh. Um, there was a lot of things involving, uh, you know, some of the revolutionary spies. Not really in Queens, but out in Nassau County. Um, 
a lot of things have actually taken place in Queens. There was a lot of uh, farms in Queens in the old days. Uh, some parts golf of courses, I know. Ancient. Jackson. Hmm? Go- golf courses, I know. Jackson yes, Heights. Golf before, courses. Yeah, before uh, Northridge, which is a big complex that my family moved to, a big okay. co-op right in the middle of, of Jackson Heights. That had been golf courses before. And, uh, As a matter of fact, I'm living in one that was originally a golf course. I'm living in, uh, right now, a Lechester. I was formed from a oh. golf course. Yeah. didn't know that. And yeah. when I think of Astoria, where you live, I think of the famous Astoria pool. Right? Oh, yeah. Um, one of the places I learned to swim, I learned to swim at camp and um, all over. But... Um, Try to describe the Astoria pool and the setting, what it was in the 50s and 60s. Um, a mecca for kids on a hot summer day. In, and you know, um, not just Queens, New York in, in the summertime, incredibly humid, incredibly hot. And uh, tell me about your memories of Astoria pool. And is it still around? Are you still going there? Um, I never really went too often to the pool, but I actually grew up on 23rd Street, which is only a couple of blocks from the pool. And I also, when I moved out into my first apartment on 18th Street, that was not far away the other way. Uh, The pool is huge. Uh, There's actually, in Astoria Park, there are actually three separate pools. There's an old diving pool that has been right. closed down for years, very deep. Oh, I didn't know that. My uncle would dive off the top of that that thing, and uh, I'm a little kid looking up. I go, whoa, this guy's got something. That was a hell of a dive in those days. Well, supposedly but, the rumor, days. and I, I don't know if it's true, there was a rumor that it was closed down for liability reasons because somebody was injured in it. Um, huh. Some people say it was just allowed to deteriorate, but the, the diving pool actually was shut down for most of my life. Uh, there were actually three pools. The middle one is the one that's still the popular one that was an Olympic-sized uh, Olympic, uh, pool. And right. some of the Olympic trials in the 1930s were actually held in that pool and in the diving pool next to it. And uh, on, the, uh, on the other end of it, there's a very small, shallow pool for children. And that complex yes. is still open. Yes. Yes. And I remember you got, you got a little locker key and you put it around your wrist with a, with a, like a little rubber band thing to go around your, your wrist. And you had showers. You take the shower before you got in. And uh, hundreds and hundreds of kids on a summer day at a story of pool. And um, I miss those days. I miss those days a lot. Did you become a Mets fan? Were you, are you a baseball fan? Queens is, is yeah, famous for baseball. Yeah, I liked the I liked Met the Mets. Um, I used to go to, to see the Mets a lot when I was in my twenties, uh, right. right around the time when they when they had a big you know big presence in the World World Series. They had Lenny Dykstra. They had uh, Mookie Wilson, who I absolutely loved because he could run fast as hell. And I just yes. admired him so much because when I was a kid, I was actually a track runner. And every time I would see Mookie Wilson um, stealing bases, I was just amazed by his foot speed and his sprinting ability. So I'd be looking yes. at him and saying he would have been some hell of a track athlete, let alone <laughs> let alone a baseball player. Right. And when you think about it, um, the Mets in those days, I think you're talking about 86, right around yes. there, were... Um, the deepest baseball team probably that I ever saw. Mookie Wilson, Lenny Dykstra, Strawberry, mm-hmm. Hojo. Um, they just had a bunch of terrific players. And Mookie has always been the class of the organization. He's um, the old school guy that um, they bring to spring training. And um, they really play up. I'm not impressed with the ownership, the current ownership of the Mets and the Wilpon, um, Ponzi scandals and all, all that. And I Made don't, off and the like. Right. Horrible stuff. Jews stealing from Jews. Um, they ripped off Sandy Koufax. Um, but something I can't, you know, 
my team, the New York Giants, left New York when I was 11, and the Mets were formed in 62, and there was like five or six years where I didn't really have a team to root for. I saw a lot of baseball at Yankee Stadium, but it wasn't the same. And when the Mets were born, I just formed a, a loyalty that has been un, undying, and I just stick with them. It's difficult. <laughs> I mean, over the years, it, it's been very difficult. Um, what do you know about the the uh, scandal that went on? The, it, you um, seem to have a recognition of what I'm talking well, about with Madoff. Sure. The only thing that I do know about the Madoff scandal is basically what has been what has been published, and uh, it was a, a Ponzi scheme. The man was basically pr- uh, promising all kinds of phenomenal returns. And paying the uh, paying the later paying the later people out of the proceeds of I should say the earlier people out of the proceeds of the later people's investments, not making any investments at all. And I do know that there was some involvement with Wilpons because they were one of the investors that that was involved in in uh, major you know major involvement with him. But I really don't know too much about what they did. I mean, so many people were absolutely destroyed by Madoff. It's rather shocking because Madoff was also a very important man in uh, in the stock exchange itself. He he was at one point, I believe, head of Nasdaq, and he was right. a very prestigious man. Um, incredibly shocking in in the sense that um, business it's just a, a microcosm of what seems to be business ethics today in in the world we live in. And as you know from being my Facebook friend, I fight what I call the the unholy trinity, which is uh, big government, um, business, and organized religion. And you and I go back and forth on an awful lot of things. I'm highly critical of the Catholic Church, and I always look for an excuse to uh, clarify that it isn't the people, it isn't the worshipers that I'm critical of. It's the hierarchy of the church, just like it isn't the postman that delivers mail that I'm critical of when I talk about the government or the the clerk that greets you when you come into the insurance office. It's not their fault. It's the hierarchy of these organizations, and I think they uh, they combined to really messing us up. How has that changed Queens? How do, if we could use that as um, uh, something to draw from, because when I left in 65, and I, I used to come back and leave to visit my parents, and they moved to, to Florida, so I don't get back there there much, but how, how do you see that changing Queens, the corruptness of, of those organizations? Well, if we talk about uh, getting back to baseball for a minute, one thing that absolutely fascinated me, I have family that actually work for for, uh, the stadium, and, you know, they've they've treated them very well. But one thing that rather shocked me, for example, we were talking about uh, Shea Stadium, which was very different from when I was growing up. They, uh, They actually took down the original stadium. And right. they put up a yes, they put up a brand new stadium, and um, first of all, they named it after Citibank, which when I was a child would have been absolute anathema. It's now called City Field, and right. also strangely enough, they uh, they shrunk the size of the ball field because well, rather to make than it more that, intimate, right? Yeah, well, to make it more intimate, but also to uh, to more accommodate. Uh, higher income people because they started putting in corporate boxes, which I thought was very peculiar because I've always associated baseball with children and families. So that's something right. culturally that I find a little bit unusual. I mean, there's probably some economics to it that I don't understand. Um, getting back to what you were talking about with situations involving organized religion, the Catholic Church, um, 
I tend to believe that that organizations that are human organizations of any type are, are open to corruption because that's the nature of human beings. Uh, one thing I've seen, which is kind of sad, is I've seen a lot of um, of the uh, neighborhood structures breaking down. A lot of the old schools that people Mary, went to Mary, can I stop? Old. Can I stop you on one thing? Sure, sure. Is it nat- Is it nature or or um, nurture in terms of what you were ta- talking about corruption? That taken lightly, that sounds very um, negative. In other words. Or the nature of human beings is corruption. I can't believe that people are born with an innate sense to to be corrupt. It has to be nurtured along the lines. Well, I think that th- that people have certain tendencies that can can lead to corruption. I mean, intelligent people have always batted these things back and forth, but I think. There are things in human nature that even go back to, you know, the lizard brain and primitive animals. There are structures that have been layered on from ancient times in the way people think. You know, there are cert- there are certain weaknesses that people have that can uh, that can come forward under certain conditions. I mean, we do you think that's inherited or? I think there think there are things in in the biology of the human brain. I mean things that go back to things that go back to ancient ancient uh, structures in your mind. I mean, you know, a love of a love of order and a love of um, authority and and ritual and and it can express itself not only in a religious sense but in a political sense, in a military sense. Uh, it has its good points. It has its bad points because if you look at something like say, you, you know. Nazi Germany or something like that, you've got something that takes something that could be good like efficiency and order and turns it into something absolutely monstrous. So there right. is that ability of the, of the human mind because of the weaknesses we have to uh, to be corrupted in certain circumstances. What do you think triggers that? Well, I think what triggers it is the biological structures of your of your brain and your mind. I okay. Mean, basic basis why, of your biology. But why, for instance, would um, two siblings with the same inherit inheritance inheritance of all these things not act out in the same way? Doesn't a lot of that have to do with what they're exposed to in their lives and um, who they meet and what they read and how they're educated and if they're educated, all those things. Oh, well, that's a different story. There you're looking at on a personal level rather than, you know, the general the general uh, way that people, the general human nature. I mean, I mean, if you even if you have two identical twins, every moment of their lives is not going to be the same. So you're definitely going to have changes in people based on the immediate experiences they have. What do you see ahead for Queens? What do you, um, there's a big building that um, we were talking about on Facebook that's being constructed, and that interested me an awful lot. It, it, tell us about that building. Um, I believe you're talking about a very large skyscraper that's going to be built in the uh, in the clock tower uh, building in Queens. And yes, it's supposed very to be structure. yes. It's supposed to be uh, the largest. It's supposed to be the largest skyscraper in Queens. It's going to actually dwarf the uh, the city, the city center, the city core center that is already on there. Right. Um, the the population density in Long Island City is just absolutely right now, as it is mind blowing. Um, I grew up in the area, as I mentioned, uh, my parents. My parents, uh, my mother and, and my grandparents lived in Astoria since the 1920s. And uh, I was born in Astoria, Queens in the 1960s. And I recall when there literally wasn't a single building in the area around Queensboro Plaza, over six stories. Uh, today, I was just over going into Manhattan and I hadn't taken the seven in any length of time, and the area is actually already turned into a giant ca- canyon. 
I mean, really? literally, yes, it is like looking at something. It's like some, looking at something like um, like Fritz Lang's Metropolis. It's the the image that went into my mind. As it is, you can you cannot see anything from the number seven train. It's completely blocked in right now. I mean, it's absolutely wow. shocking. It's absolutely shocking, yeah. and the um, because this, that this, was all you could go out to Shea Stadium for. You come into the city, and you just it's like um, you're open. It's the, it's the subway, but it's the elevated. So it was the elevated subway, and um, views were were striking, and um, and that's no longer available. That's no longer no. the case. No. No, not if you get into Queen. If you get into Queens Plaza, I mean, some of the other areas that get further on, you still not you're not seeing it yet. But the area right. has been turned into complete canyons. In fact, it's worse than it is in Manhattan, because in a good part of Manhattan there were laws that that required setbacks. I don't know if you're familiar with the term. No, I'm not. Would you explain that? The um, setbacks are, if you would take a look at buildings like uh, the Chrysler Building or you would look at the um, Empire State Building, the way they're designed is they become narrower as they get higher. And the purpose of that particular construction is to allow light to penetrate into the street. So if you look at an area that is designed like that, which is most of midtown Manhattan, and then you would say go into Wall Street where that is not required and most of the buildings are somewhat angular and square like boxes. If you walk right. around at street level in an area like that where the setbacks are not required, you see it becomes a canyon effect. It becomes very dark. And this is what's actually happening around Long Island City. The area is wow. becoming walled in very similar to the way it would look in downtown Manhattan. Because they don't require setbacks on any of those buildings. You know, I'm looking at you're a civil engineer. And no, I'm I've not a had... civil engineer. I'm not a civil engineer. I've worked for civil engineers. Oh, I okay. Am, oh no, but I have worked for civil engineers. I worked for the in the accreditation area of American Society of Civil Engineers in the 90s. A lot of my friends are, are civil engineers. I have an interest in architecture and engineering, but I'm a layperson. Okay, but you, you do have an interest and you um, have more than just a, a passing amount of knowledge about it. Now, I, I'm going to take you to 911. Is it possible that um, that, that wasn't an inside job and that um, that building, especially Building 7, I think it was called, or 11, um, imploded on its own? Or what's the story? Do you think that... It, that we're being um, misled in any way. I just wanted from, from honestly, you. I believe honestly, I believe that uh, if a plane that is absolutely full of jet fuel hits a building, I believe that that the actual official explanation could definitely explain how those buildings could come down. The reason being that when they built those particular buildings. They were designed to use a type of fireproofing uh, that was a spray on asbestos. And it was supposed to be something that would protect the building. It was the fire rating of the building included the expectation that the entire building would use this material. But as you know, it's an extreme carcinogen. So at one point, yes, at one point, they removed this particular spray on asbestos. And the building was only partially fireproofed. So they wound up with the worst of both worlds. They wound up with asbestos on part of the building that could blow all over the city. And another yeah. part of the building wasn't properly fireproofed, I believe, but I'm not an engineer. I believe that you could get something uh, hot enough that would cause a building to pancake like that because if you put a lot of heat to certain types of steels and metals, they do become structurally weak, and they start to become flexible and structurally weak long before they melt. And you could have things that would snap and would break. But I'm a non-engineer. I wouldn't know. But based on the little I know about science, 
it's possible for something like that to come down the way it did because it, it had a very strange construction that involved uh, a use of a central column support instead of distributing uh, distributed columns like you would see in an older building like the Empire State Building or something like that. We have a lot of different columns taking part of the load. I mean, they basically built these things to create a lot of rentable space, and they have certain right. Achilles heels because of that. You know, a lot of air to, to fan a fire, and right. not a lot of not a lot of interior structures to bear the load. When one thing goes, the whole thing goes. But I'm not an engineer. This is just what I've seen from studying some of the books about it, and and uh, and the design, and you know, and reading about skyscraper design in New York. Because there's a few different ways of doing a skyscraper, and there seems to be some vulnerabilities there. And realistically speaking, if you were to build a building like that. You would probably want it to come down in such a way that it would come straight down and would not tilt over and take out half the city. So there is that aspect right. of something, you know, falling down instead of sideways if you're talking about something that's 110 stories high. Good point. Very good point. It could have been a lot worse from that that standpoint. Do you think if the planes came in lower, they might have might have tilted the building? I mean, I... No, no, because of the way the building is designed. Because it's gonna, it's gonna go because of the way down. the building yeah, because the way the building was designed, according to what I've read, I'm not a structural engineer, but basically the way the the building was designed was they have a thin curtain wall on the outside of the building and a lot of the, the weight of the building is distributed through the, the the floor supports and it's attached to the central column. So it's kind of like a chandelier. It's kind of like right. a chandelier where, where if you cut something off, the, the crystals would fall. So it's kind of like right. that. It's kind of like that kind of design. So when you cut it in the right place, the whole thing is going to pancake. At least from what I've read. From what I've read about right. it. Tell me about how the instance brought the city together. From what what brought the city together? The 911 instance. Oh, 911. Yeah, that was a very, very brutal experience. 911. Um, it was. It was a very, very shocking thing to go through. Um, I remember on 911 myself. I was working. I I was between jobs actually, and I had just decided to go down to West Street, which is where they used to have the old Board of Elections in New York. And I was getting a job that day to work the primary. It was the mayoral primary in New York City. It was the same day as 9-11. And uh, while I was waiting for my assignment, I had actually just decided to go to a place in Maspeth. I heard that the buildings were under assault. Initially, right. it sounded like an accident. There was somebody telling me about a plane hitting the building, and my reaction was, oh, some foolish person flying some right. tiny plane. And then a few minutes later, we had the second one. They canceled it. You know, they canceled all the elections throughout New York. The, the primary was over. They had to take all the people who were um, guarding the polls, and they had to send them into the city. Um, I also am related to somebody who was very, very high official in the corrections department and uh, it was a very challenging time after 9-11 just to even find you know trying to find remains of people uh, my brother-in-law was down at the site for weeks trying to dig out people to uh, reunite them with their families it was a very very wow. difficult difficult time definitely yeah. I came back to visit uh, the city about 10, 11 years ago, and I, you know, Queens, where, as the crow flies, we're talking about seven miles, I think, um, from where you are in Astoria to where where this happened and yeah. where the buildings were. And, you know, I'm so used to seeing that skyline and to to look from Queens into the city and not seeing those buildings, it was absolutely eerie. I mean, it just, um, I felt violated as a native New Yorker and as a, an American citizen and all, 
all those things. How do you think that's changed us as, as people over the years? I mean, did they really win because uh, it seems that our industry is, bu- is built on terrorist protection and homeland security? Um, did they win that way? I get sirens going off outside. Probably because you're a hot guest, Mary. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, it, I'm I'll kidding. tell you, it does. I'll tell you, it does disturb me a great deal. And in one sense, they did win as much as I, as I hate to admit it, because uh, an example of how these people won. When I was a youth, I used to often do temp work, and 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 I would I would go down to um, to Wall Street, which I've always loved. Right. And since 9/11, they've put all kinds of weird barriers around. They have these things they can raise and lower, like drawbridges that can rip the inside of a car open. They have policemen with police dogs outside the stock exchange. Uh, The back of the stock exchange on New Street has been completely closed to traffic. You cannot walk behind that street at all. Um, It it disturbs me because I, I look at it and I say, you know, I know we have to do these things, but but it horrifies me because I have family also. My father was in, in London during the Blitz, and he was in the RAF at age 18 in the 1940s, and he lived through the Blitz, and he told me stories about the Blitz. I'm thankful he didn't live through 9-11. Yet the people of London went through such terrible, terrible bombs and everything else, and yet it didn't create the degree of fear and paranoia that I still see in New York today. Yeah, like and in some the ways I find coming? that offensive. I'm sorry? Yeah. It's like where's the next one going to hit? Is it going to be in the subway? Is it going to be in Port Authority? Yeah, all these crazy thoughts that go through your head. Um, it does make for a lot of paranoia. And, uh I'm proud of the way, though, that the city did come together as people and throughout throughout it all. And you hit on it with the asbestos and the, the fire retardant things that really screwed up the um, the environment and uh, made for an awful lot of these first rescuers suffering horribly in shortened lives over the last 10, 12 years. And um, it's horrible. It's terrible. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. Yes, a lot of people, when they did this, people were so, um, you know, they were so, uh, con- uh, 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 you know, thinking of the immediate things that they had to deal with. I heard stories about people not being given respirators and um one of the big politicians, uh, what's her name, Whitman or whatever, she was in charge of nine uh, of the nine uh, eleven uh, aftermath to clean it up, and right. you know there was there was downplaying the need to use respirators, and I understand that a lot of these people have died of uh, various lung related diseases. Um, it was just a very brutal experience. Um, right now, I live in an area called Electchester, which was, I moved from Astoria, Queens. And Electchester was actually founded by IBEW Local 3, the, inter- the International Brotherhood of Electric Workers, Local 3. And they lost over a dozen electrical workers from that union alone, the youngest one being 17 and the oldest one being in his 50s. And one of the workers, at least one of the workers, died a full year after 9-11 because of exposure and damage that that was done to his body as a result of being down there that day. Some of the people that also survived got lungs full of all kinds of terrible things, and and they, you know, they passed away. Very, very difficult situation. Did you hear any rumors before 9-11 that, it was coming, or was there any talk on the street, or any warnings, or anything that you picked up on that you could, um, no. looking back, you can say no, oh, no, no, not for me. They say that you know the the intelligence community and so forth may have known things, 
But as an ordinary person, it was a bolt from the blue. I mean, I can't even tell you how shocking it was because the day before it happened, I was at the beach. I was at Jones Beach. It was a beautiful day. And I said, oh, my God, it's gorgeous. I I would like to come back here tomorrow, but I have to go and see if I can get some kind of work in, in, in West Street. And I was going in that day to Board of Elections, which, by the way, I came out later, and you can see not you could see the burning towers from Vernon Jackson Boulevard, which was right across from West Street, and that was one of the things I did witness coming out. But going in there that day, the sky was cobalt blue. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was just absolutely magnificent, and it was one of the most beautiful days I have ever seen in New York. Ironically, they say that that helped them kill all those people because they could see the building so well to hit them. But I can't even tell you that the weather that day and how magnificent it was, and then what happened later was just just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, all of the transportation in the city shut down. I mean, I remember getting out of uh, of Board of Elections, and I knew that there was not going to be any way for some of the people from Manhattan to get back into Manhattan because the subways, buses, and everything were closed. And I remember telling one person, I said, you have 15 minutes to run across the 59th Street Bridge before everybody gets out of their shock and realizes that's the only way out. And I said, you must go across the 59th Street Bridge as fast as you can while the people are still in shock so you can get into Manhattan before they figure it out that 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 crossway is the only way across and you have to make it across before the people start coming the opposite way. And I literally told someone who was trapped to run as fast as she could up the pedestrian crosswalk so she could make it from one side to the other before the people could figure it out. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Yeah. Good thinking under pressure, Mary. I mean, um, listen, um, you've been terrific. Let's make this um, ongoing, and you'll come back again, and we'll talk about stuff as life unfolds, I hope. Well, I hope that I've I've been a good guest, and I hope that people will really Absolutely. enjoy your pod, pod, podcast. Oh. This is informative and um, gives me the spirit that I've been looking for from New York. I'm trying to be bi-coastal. I'm trying to live on both coasts if I possibly can. And uh, it's a good goal because I miss the New York spirit an awful lot. Oh, you have to come back. You'll have a ball. Well, um, my plans are Florida because um, I'm kind of a hothouse plant. And I don't know if I could live four seasons in in New York. It's um, it's been in the 60s out here for the last couple of weeks in Northern California. It's been kind of overcast, but it's in in the 60s, and it bothers me that the the sun isn't shining all the time. So, um, but the one thing about the the beautiful four seasons, though, is the splendid um, changes in the trees and the colors. Um, I do miss that, for sure. Absolutely. Mary, October th- is the best month. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely that. Or April. I mean, uh, yeah. and ironically, where I live in, in Northern California, it's either a um, spring day or a fall day most every day. We don't have much summer, and we certainly don't have much winter. But, um, yes, October in New York, the only thing um, – um, you knew winter was coming, and winters could be brutal. You had a brutal one last year, my friend Mert was telling me. Oh, yeah. We had this last winter. We had several major blizzards. We right. had several major blizzards, and uh, we also had the strange experience. There were blizzards in upstate New York. There was a six-foot blizzard in in Buffalo, and we had the strange right. experience of sending people from New York City all the way up to Buffalo to help them dig out, only to have a similar, similar not six feet, but a couple of feet in New York a few days later, and they had to roll them all back and get people from Buffalo to help us. 
I mean, the city the city had had you know foot plus snow all over the place this year. Unbelievable. Right. And it wasn't melting, and just as it would melt a little bit, you get another snowstorm, and um, oh, it's horrible. <laughs> just, oh, it's um, brutal. Yeah. So let's hope it's a nice summer for you, and um, I'm thrilled that you were here. I'm going to end the segment like I do every segment that I put out there. I'm going to implore you, my guest, Mary, and uh, all my listenership to keep your dreams wet and your humor dry. <laughs> keep, your kids, keep your kids away from military recruiting stations. And, of course, off the laps of clerics wearing dresses. And to keep on keeping on. <laughs> Just do the best you can. And uh, loved having you, Mary. Thanks for being my Facebook friend. Thanks for, be, for coming up and always having the um, the devil's advocate for me when I get off on a tangent <laughs> on Facebook. It's the best way to go. You are incredibly, you might think you, if people saw our conversations, and I say, well, these are two argumentative people. No, we're just, we have opinions. We're not opinionated. We don't stand on, we don't get insulted when we're, when the other person shows an opinion. You just have opinions, and that's the way New Yorkers are. They express those opinions, and um, I find it terrific being your friend. So um, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody, and um, hope you'll return soon. Sounds great. Take care. All right. Be well, Mayor. Bye-bye.